got the whole world in his hands. He got the whole world in his hands. The whole world in his hands. He got the whole world in his hands. The young and the old in his hands. He got the young and the old in his hands. He got the young and old in his hands. He got the whole world in his hands. He's got the sick and the healthy in his hands. He's got the sick and the healthy in his hands. He's got, got the sick and the healthy in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Trump prepares to hit the road was the headline in Politico after the president had spent six weeks holed up in the White House. Like the rest of us, I'm sure he was going stir crazy and was ready to get out of the house. In our text for today, we find Jesus on the road again. And since others are with him, let's at least mentally get out of the house and join them on the road with Jesus. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit upon him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later, he will rise again. Jesus has spent the past several months avoiding the cities and taking the back roads for social distancing. Like us, he was trying to avoid crowds and avoid confrontations with authorities. His reason for doing so, however, was to focus on the disciples and to get them ready for his departure. He's now on the road to Jerusalem, and with him are two distinct groups of people. The disciples, the twelve, are referred to as them and they, and the sentence construction indicates those who followed constituted another group. So we actually have three pictures of people on the road together. Jesus, who walks ahead, disciples, who are amazed, and followers who are fearful. Let's give some thought to each and see if we can't understand why they are where they are and why they are feeling what they're feeling. The first is Jesus, who walks ahead of the rest. This is the first time Mark mentions that Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. But Luke makes it clear that this isn't a decision he's just now making. In Luke 9, 51, shortly after the transfiguration, we read, And it came about when the days were approaching for his ascension that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. In Luke 13, 22, we read, And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And when some benevolent Pharisees warned him that Herod wanted to kill him, we also read in Luke 13, and he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem, knowing full well what awaits him there. And he's already told the disciples on two occasions what will happen when he gets there. In Mark 8:31, some six months earlier, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days, rise again. Mark goes on to say he was stating the matter plainly. 
And Matthew tells us he explicitly told them he must go to Jerusalem to suffer these things. The disciples' reaction to this announcement, however, was expressed by Peter. God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. So Jesus stated it again a few days later. In Mark 9, 31, we find him saying, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. Mark says, or Luke says, he prefaced these words by saying, Let these words sink into your ears. But Mark says they did not understand, and they were afraid to ask him. Matthew notes, They were deeply grieved. Obviously, Jesus' decision to go to Jerusalem wasn't one that was made in consensus with the disciples. It was his decision alone. And that's why he was walking alone on ahead of them. He was determined. And he knew where he was going. He wasn't just blindly wandering about Palestine, an itinerant preacher preaching a message of love and peace, as some would suggest. He didn't stumble into a trap in Jerusalem and get caught up in events that were out of his control. He had set his face toward Jerusalem, knowing full well what would happen there. Knowing that, gives us great confidence in him. And it actually motivates us to follow him and to embrace him as our Lord and Savior. Unlike some who would have us follow after them today, he knew where he was going and why he was going there. Those following him on the road to Jerusalem, however, wouldn't understand why Jesus was so determined to go to Jerusalem until after everything had transpired. It didn't make sense to them for him to be walking into a brood of vipers just waiting to sink their fangs into his flesh. And so the disciples are amazed. To say the disciples didn't understand Jesus would be a gross understatement. When he said how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God, they were amazed. When he said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, they were astonished. Now they're on the road with Jesus, heading to Jerusalem, and they don't want to get too close to him. They let him walk on ahead by himself. They don't know what to expect from him, and their heads are spinning. They're amazed at what he's saying and doing and where he's going. Now, it wasn't because he hadn't explained things to them. He had often taken them aside to clarify points and to answer questions. He had even stayed out of the limelight for almost a year so he could devote his time to them. He wasn't keeping them in the dark about his plans. They just didn't like his plan. It didn't make sense to them. It didn't fit their preconceived ideas about the Messiah. He wasn't meeting their expectations. They knew him well enough to follow him and to even commit to being his disciples, but they didn't understand him. The amazement they felt wasn't a good thing. They weren't standing in awe of him. They were befuddled by him. And if something didn't change, they would have no doubt fallen further and further behind him and would have eventually left him, which, in fact, they did for a time when he was arrested. You know, I think many of us can identify with their state of mind. We've accepted the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, And we've committed ourselves to following him. But we find ourselves often befuddled by him. We don't understand why he's told us to do some of the things he's told us to do. And we certainly don't understand why he allows some of the things to happen to us that happen. Quite frankly, 
he doesn't always meet our expectations. And like the disciples, we often find ourselves holding back. We're afraid to get too close to him because we're afraid he might ask us to do something that just doesn't make sense to us. Instead of withdrawing from him, however, we need to get closer. We need to get closer to him and deeper into his word so we can at least gain a little more understanding of what he's doing and why. The last thing we want is to become like the followers on the road who were fearful. As we've already noted, those who followed are a distant group, a distinct group, separate from the disciples. They no doubt included some who had been following Jesus for a time, as well as curiosity seekers who had just attached themselves to the crowd. They were people who really didn't know what was going on, but wanted to be where the action was. They could, however, sense the tension in the air. They knew something was up. The disciples were obviously stressed, and Jesus was walking by himself, heading to Jerusalem. They were attracted to Jesus. They had heard a lot about him, but didn't really know him. So they just followed at a distance. They're like a lot of people today who hang around the fringes of faith. They really don't know what Jesus has said or what he's done, but are attracted to him nonetheless. They would like to get closer, but can see that those who claim to know him and have identified themselves as his disciples are confused by him and unsure of what to expect from him. So they stand back, too fearful to come closer. The best thing we can do for them is get closer to Jesus ourselves and let him explain things again and assure us once more that he knows where he's going and there is no need to be afraid because Jesus knows what's ahead. The thing that scares us the most about the politicians and even the medical experts who expect us to follow their instructions is that they really don't know what's ahead. Their projections keep changing, and the models they put together are in constant need of revision. Jesus, on the other hand, absolutely knows what's ahead. And he's told us what to expect, even though we may not like what's in the immediate future. So like the disciples, we fail to hear everything he's saying. And as he did with them, he keeps trying to open our eyes to the big picture. Once again, Jesus took the disciples aside and began telling them what was going to happen to him. This is now at least the third time he's told them what's going to happen. He did, however, add a few more details this time. Not only would he be delivered or betrayed into the hands of the chief priests and scribes who would condemn him to death, they would then deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles who would mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. Matthew records that he actually said they would crucify him. If he would have stopped there, I'm sure they all would have run away. Knowing the details of his abuse and execution wouldn't take away the fear. It would only enhance it. But he added something, as he always did when speaking of his impending death. And three days later, he will rise again. Now, this wasn't a vague I'll rise again, that could be misunderstood as a reference to the final resurrection of the dead, as Martha had assumed when he said Lazarus would rise again, and she responded, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. 
Jesus emphasized the fact that he would rise again three days later or on the third day. And he had intimated that fact even before he had started stating it plainly. When the Pharisees had asked for a sign that would prove to them his divinity, he said no sign would be given except for the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And even before that, after cleansing the temple for the first time at the beginning of his ministry, when challenged to prove his authority to do such, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Now John notes that even though the Jews didn't realize it at the time, Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. They would later use that statement to try to indict him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. <laughs> but by then, the chief priests and Pharisees had come to understand what he was talking about. When they went to Pilate after his death, asking him to secure the tomb, they said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. He had made it plain enough that his enemies understood it. But his disciples didn't, at least not until after the resurrection. And even then, he had to explain it to them. After eating a piece of broiled fish in their presence to assure them they weren't seeing a ghost, he said, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. What Jesus was going to Jerusalem to do had been prophesied hundreds of years earlier. Now, admittedly, much of prophecy had been veiled in types and pictures that wouldn't be fully understood until after the fact. But Jesus opened the disciples' minds to understand the scriptures. He may have even quoted to them from the prophet Hosea, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like rain, like the spring rain, watering the earth. Jesus knows what's ahead. He knew what would happen in Jerusalem and he knew how it would all end. He would rise from the dead. And in doing so, he would bring victory over death to us as well. He wants us to know he knew what would happen long before it happened. So we can have confidence in him today. We may not understand everything he does or doesn't do, but we do know his going forth is as certain as the dawn. So let us press on to know the Lord and let us have confidence to follow him even through the valley of the shadow of death or the cloud of COVID-19 fearing no evil. Let's pray together. 
Thank you, Father. Thank you for revealing to us the future. For making sure we know that we are secure in your presence, in your grace, in your love. And no matter what seems to be going on and what's happening in the immediate vicinity of our lives is is not the end all. You're still in control. And you know how it's going to end. Help us maintain that confidence. Help us not to be caught up in fear of that which is unknown. Let us build a life based on what we know is going to happen that someday, someday soon, Jesus is going to break forth. He's going to come as sure as the dawn. He's going to receive us into his presence. All pain, all sorrow, all sickness will be gone will be as you intended life to be in the very beginning. In your presence, sharing your joys and your glory, sharing life to the full. Until then, we just trust you. And we are confident you hold the future in your hands. In Christ's name. Amen. You may be aware through social media posts that Gabe convinced his uncle to raise honeybees. This idea was born as Gabe to watch bees collect pollen and nectar from dandelions at my brother's farm. And if you know my brother, you know that he can't turn down a crazy idea, especially if the idea comes from his nieces or nephew. So after a Zoom class with a local instructor, many YouTube videos, several trips to the store, and a few hundred dollars, we are now bee owners. As with most new adventures, there is excitement. There is lots of work. And there may even be some tears. But the one thing I didn't expect is the overwhelming fascination with bees the more you learn about them. This fascination includes the incredible similarities between a bee colony and the Christian church. I don't know what you know about bees, but what I remember from school, and vaguely at that, is that bees are good for the world because they pollinate crops and plants. And that's important. But after that, I couldn't tell you much more about bees other than that it hurts when they sting you. But did you know that 30% of the world's crops and 90% of all plants require cross-pollination to spread and thrive? It is said that about one out of every four bites of food or sips of a beverage is made possible because of pollinators. And you guessed it, bees rank number one when it comes to pollination. In a colony of bees, there's only one queen bee. The vast majority of the bees in a colony are worker bees, and they perform different functions to serve the colony and the queen. Some responsibilities of the worker bees include taking care of the young bees, feeding the bees that can't feed themselves, taking care of the queen and then spreading the queen's scent to the rest of the hive, Securing and preserving the pollen that is brought in by foraging bees who are out bringing in the food. Cell building and cleaning. And also guarding and protecting the colony. Bees work together to ensure the survival of their colony. As a church, a body of believers, are we not designed the same as a colony of bees? There is only one head in which we serve and in our case, it's a king. There are many parts to the body, and we all have different roles, but we are all dependent upon each other for survival. We need workers to take care of our young. We need workers to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. We need workers to bring in food and supplies. We need workers to properly store and utilize those food and supplies. We need workers to fix and clean our house of worship, and we need workers to protect us from the enemy. 
and we need all workers to spread the word and love of Jesus our King. We are a body and we need each other for survival. We cannot do this alone. This is why God is so concerned about the unity of Christians and constantly urges believers to walk in harmony and fellowship. The integrity of the body of Christ is a major obligation of every Christian. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Colossians 1, 18. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the Spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1, 27. The amazing parallel between the church and a hive of bees is so close, it seems, that it was designed that way. The God-given principles that hold Christians in necessary fellowship are the same principles that keep a hive of bees together. Even though we are not physically together this morning at this time of communion, we are all still a body of believers that depend upon each other. And we are a body with only one head that deserves our praise, our honor, and our service. Let us do that now.